everyone. My name is Bhaskar Sankar. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin. This is another Jacobin talk, as you might be able to tell by the yellow bar above my head and by the fact that you're on the Jacobin YouTube channel or Facebook page. But uh, I've been joined a couple times a week, mostly Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at around 6 p.m. to talk with a left-wing thinker about a provocative idea for around 25, 30 minutes. And then after that, we've been doing a quick Q&A with our audience. So if you want to participate in that audience, please um, log in, press subscribe, and leave a comment for our guest. Uh, today, we are talking with Richard Seymour. Uh, Richard is someone that I've interacted with for at least 12 years or so. He's a writer and broadcaster, a longtime socialist uh, based in the UK. He writes regularly for The Guardian. You might have seen his writing in Jacobin. He was actually an early supporter of Jacobin. We were in our infancy and needed all the help we can get. He wrote for our uh, third issue, actually a piece that, that holds up quite well. I think the title was How the Left Can Win in Britain. And his sage wisdom was not followed. And the left has so far not yet won in, in Britain or anywhere else. But, um, you know, he's someone who who really uh, was an important figure in, in the, the blogosphere on the radical left, thinking through a lot of important strategic uh, dilemmas. Uh, his first book, The Liberal Defense of Murder, really stands up as the very best book uh, on the pitfalls of so-called humanitarian intervention. It's, it's a really thorough work. It's not, I think maybe from the title, it sounds like a polemical um, work. And obviously there's, there's lots of polemics in there and, and from, from his blogging material, I think people know that Richard can do the polemic well, but it's a very thorough history and it's really worth your time. Uh, he also wrote a book on Corbin. Uh, Richard, is that just called Corbin? Oh, yep, yeah, it's called Corbin. <laughs> um, and uh, I shouldn't make fun of him for that title because the name of this Jacobin talk is Jacobin Talks. So who am I to, to criticize? But his latest book with a better title is The Twittering Machine which is out later this month if you're in the US. Uh, it's uh, out already in the UK. Uh, please do support our friends at Verso, buy from the Verso site. I also believe, depending on the structure of Richard's contract, you might get slightly higher royalties if you buy it from the Verso site as opposed to Amazon. But either way, it's better for the world. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about Winston Churchill. So Richard wrote an article a couple years back for Jacobin on the real Winston Churchill. You know, he's a he's a figure that has been obviously very polarizing within the UK um, and especially in uh, the former colonies of, of Britain, in which he left an especially disastrous uh, legacy. In a way, he's he's almost like a the, probably the best thing I could say about Winston Churchill is that he's a figure that has united the masses of Ireland, Africa, Greece and India together uh, because he's run them all. Um, and um, that piece we occasionally recycle on the Jacobin uh, site and it draws the ire of the right every time. I think the Daily Caller or was it, oh, Daily Wire, they're, they're really unoriginal on the right with how they title things, um, released a piece uh, today say, saying why small men hate Churchill. What's funny about this is that Daily Wire, if I'm not mistaken, was founded by Ben, I have a problem with WAP, um, uh, Shapiro, who's uh, a very slight man. I mean, I'm a slight man as well. I just, you know, don't make it into a brand. You know, I haven't haven't made much money off, off being short. You know, he has figured it out. Um, uh, probably the, the most famous short man since Muggsy Bowes. But um, in any case, Richard is going to talk about the life and legacy of Churchill. Um, a man that I, I think uh, decades of a really sordid uh, political history has been washed away by a couple nice speeches. So in five minutes, he washed away maybe five decades of, of terrible uh, deeds. So Rich is gonna talk about the real Winston Churchill, about how his legacy is remembered today as well, and, and the political importance, I think, of, of pushing back against it. Obviously, John McDonnell, a lot of people on the British labor left have at various times criticized Churchill and then gotten a, a, a hell of a ton of criticism from the mainstream press in the UK and abroad for doing so. 
I think Richard will tell us why they're right. And then in the meantime, press like, press subscribe. That's how we get the channel out there to more people. And if you leave your comments, we will ask Richard them afterwards. But thank you for staying up late with us, Richard, and I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. So <clears throat> just to clarify from the start, I am not a Churchill historian. Um, there are plenty of them out there, um, and I've just read some Churchill histories, but I'm just somebody who's really um, annoyed and irritated by the official hagiographies, by the Churchill myth, um, and uh, that's really what I'm trying to debunk. I have my um, speech notes over here, so I'm going to be looking over here quite a lot. Um, but first of all, just to say, um, in terms of the context of Churchill, um, the importance of Churchill as a national fetish, and also a fetish object for your um, uh, conservatives, for your Republican Party, for uh, your warmongers, um, I think it's worth saying that, first of all, um, uh, the we've had a, a lot of rows about you know um, defacing and damaging and taking down statues um, and in the United Kingdom Churchill's statue was defaced by Black Lives Matter protesters pointing out yeah Churchill was a racist um, but actually um, this tradition of defacing Churchill goes back a long way you can go back to the um, uh, Seattle protests and the aftermath uh, we had some anti-capitalist protests in the UK, not massive, but fairly, uh, you know, reasonable and lively. And one of the first things they did was they decorated the Churchill statue with um, a, a bit of um, turf from the lawn, um, giving him a green mohawk, and uh, spray painted a bit of red blood dripping from his mouth, uh, which um, I thought was a, a, a rather appropriate piece of artistic innovation. Um, Churchill is a sort of cottage industry in the UK. There have been innumerable movies and books made about him. Um, he's the last uh, prime minister in the UK that was being truly loved by millions of people in the UK. Most prime ministers here aren't loved, they're tolerated. Um, books with the titles like Never Surrender, The Last Lion, The Finest Hour, things like that, all that Churchilliana. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, our prime minister, for God's sake, has a book called The Churchill Factor, um, in which he tries to associate himself with the Churchill myth. Um, there's a lot of movies, Albert Finney, Gary Oldman, Michael Gambon, Brian Cox, Brendan Gleeson. These um, national treasures um, have uh, found in the Churchill myth a sort of uh, unemployment agency um, for them to produce straight to DVD movies. Um, and of course, you know, there's a tradition of politicians, um, not just British politicians, um, trying to associate themselves with Churchill. Uh, I remember during the war in Iraq, uh, Cherie Blair uh, came out and said of her husband, Tony, that uh, he would in time be remembered as a great figure like Churchill. Um, and, uh, you know, Tony, George W. Bush was uh, compared with Churchill, the thinker president. Um, but actually, there's a long tradition of this on the American right. Nixon. Uh, like to associate himself with Churchill, would often evoke him. Reagan, when he moved into the White House, had a, a portrait of Churchill put up uh, in the Situation Room so that he could think about Churchill while he was plotting his moves against the dastardly communists and the evil empire and prepare us for the end of days, which we're approaching with ever greater haste. Um, his um, uh, Secretary of State, I think, Caspar Weinberger, um, was also a big fan of Churchilliana. You could actually go through the list of them. There's quite a lot of them, and it always comes up. And neoconservatives in the US um, being the most committed to uh, a global uh, empire run by the US uh, are the most fond of Churchill. So that's just to outline something of the cultural and political resonance of Churchill um, globally as a man who um, evokes ideas of defiance, belligerence, and overwhelming force uh, in the face of uh, real threats. Um, and you know, obviously people are thinking of World War II, Adolf Hitler, and so on. As I will um, uh, presently demonstrate, um, there's a lot more to Churchill than that. And those aspects of Churchill are quite relevant. Uh, because when we think about, I'm going to spend most of my time uh, criticizing and debunking Churchill as a bit of a ruling class thug and a monster. Um, but I think as, uh, as good Marxists, we have to be dialectical about this. We have to take the, understand the um, 
creativity and resources of the bourgeoisie when they display it. And Churchill was a far-sighted imperialist. Um, there was a, a famous uh, anecdote from when he was uh, he met with um, one of Roosevelt's juniors uh, in 1939. And Roosevelt Jr. was trying to persuade him that war was futile, that Britain would get hammered. And he, uh, with his whiskey and soda and a cigar, um, gave uh, a counter speech, uh, in which he said he'd rather die in that case. But uh, in that case, it would be up to the Americans to take over and they would have to think imperially. A phrase that uh, really resonates uh, in the Churchillian register, think imperially, which to him meant uh, insofar as a, a conservative uh, is capable of doing so, to think historically and globally. In other words, to think uh, in, you know, in the context of how the world is run. Um, he had a panoptic view of affairs, which is quite rare of today's ruling class in particular. Um, he thought historically because, of course, he was personally sedimented into history. He was um, a distant... Uh, um, grandson, great-great-grandson of something of the first Duke of Marlborough, whose uh, military successes for the British Empire were legendary. He was the son of Lord uh, Randolph Churchill, uh, born in Blenheim Palace of all places. Um, and Lord Randolph was a, a successful Tory and uh, a, an imperialist um, ideal, ideologue and rabble-rouser, although more complicatedly than his son. Um, and so Winston Churchill uh, sort of thought and fought globally. He was confident uh, in himself. He thought he was destined for greatness. He had that ruling class confidence. He was confident that Britain was a great civilizing uh, force, that the English speaking peoples were a great race, um, and that they were equal to the world's challenges if they deployed overwhelming force. And he wrote innumerable books, multi-volume histories, biographies, biographies of his uh, sort of illustrious relatives, uh, autobiography, biography of his father. He wrote uh, multi-volume histories of the Second World War, of the English-speaking peoples. Uh, he wrote a history of the American Civil War, the Boer War, the Afghan War, the Sudan War, the First World War, and the Second World War. And uh, most of those wars he actually fought in, um, or was uh, a combatant uh, or a belligerent in. Ultimately, of course, any sort of uh, transcendent point of view achieved um, from a, you know, from within a bourgeois imperialist framework was limited by his idiotic prejudice, racism, and predilection for enormous violence. Because this is the thing that I was struck by when I really started to dig into um, Churchill's reputation and just try to find out a little bit more about him. And just reading perfectly ordinary mainstream histories, um, of Churchill, even the ones that are written by official hagiographers like, for example, Martin Gilbert. Um, he absolutely loved violence, death, and danger. Um, and because he believed that his greatness that he was destined for would come from empire, he could be quite physically courageous in battle. He wrote uh, to his mother um, that he looked forward to battle, not so much in spite of, as because of the risks that I run. Now, if he had been confined to domestic politics, he would have been some mixture of Whiggish liberal and Tory Democrat, rather like his father, Lord Randall. Um, he, in fact, uh, was capable of uh, breaching class lines. He was a bit of a maverick in this respect. So, for example, he, when he joined the Lord George administration, he supported its in introduction of the rudiments of a welfare state, although he was ferociously hostile to socialism and communism. Uh, he was, of course, deeply authoritarian, um, and one mustn't think that his authoritarianism was uh, just overseas and just with regard to the empire and its subjects. Um, he supported profoundly authoritarian policies when faced with social disobedience at home. So, for example, uh, one of the uh, most infamous episodes was uh, in his career, uh, from the point of view of labor supporters and the left and the, and the trade unions in this country, uh, many of whom still remember it, um, is when he deployed police against striking minors. And there is a bit of a myth, um, a mistaken idea that he actually deployed uh, armed, armed forces. What he actually did was he sent armed forces to Cardiff um, so that he could deploy them if he needed to 
against the miners, but he never actually had to deploy them. But he was quite prepared to do so. Um, in another instance, uh, he uh, took control of police operations during a battle with armed Latvian anarchists in Stepney. Um, and uh, what he actually did was he uh, engineered a situation where uh, their building was on fire and he let them burn to death. Um, so he was quite, um, you know, to uh, enemies. He didn't really believe uh, in the necessity for compromise negotiation or any of that stuff. Um, he also, uh, even, you know, domestically, he understood the world through empire. And this wasn't just a, a matter of his background. Of course, his father, Lord Randolph, um, was um, uh, you know part of ruling Ireland for a period of time, and uh, young Winston grew up for a while in, uh, in in Ireland in Dublin, and observed his father ruling Ireland, and partly for that reason, I think, always opposed home rule for the Irish. Um, but he understood the world through empire, and his first two political speeches were in defense of empire, and often in that uh, uh, distinctly Churchillian bluster that we've uh, become familiar with. Um, and so having uh, developed as a politician, a Tory politician, um, becoming an MP in 1900, becoming president of the Board of Trade in uh, 1908, becoming Home Secretary in 1910, it was quite logical that um, having you know fought on all the front lines of the British Empire and having been uh, a, you know such a high-flying Tory careerist, he should be appointed first Lord of the Admiralty, or which is the highest post in the Royal Navy, um, in World War One. Um, and he was absolutely thrilled to be part of World War One. He said, and this is a quite a famous quote: "My God, this." This is living history. Everything we are doing and saying is thrilling. It will be read by a thousand generations. Think of that. Why I would not be out of this glorious, delicious war for anything the world could give me. Now, because of his um, uh, audacity and boldness, um, he could achieve sometimes great things from, from the point of view of the empire. Um, but also he could achieve uh, incredible blunders. And of course, he was notoriously responsible for the military disaster in Dardanelle, uh, wherein he atten attempted to force um, uh, the Turkish to sue for peace uh, by occupying the Dardanelle Strait. Um, the result was uh, an utter calamity, a complete waste of men chewing up units and, and so on. Nonetheless, with his incredible ruling class confidence, he was back in charge very soon. He was made Minister of Munitions, he was then made Secretary of War, and then he was Secretary of Air. And he, it should be said, was uh, incredibly technophilic, um, particularly about war. Uh, he adored new technologies. He was a champion of their early adoption. And uh, as, you know, the aerial techniques of war making were just evolving, he wanted uh, Britain to be on the front line of this. It also made sense uh, that at this time, Ch Churchill should be vehemently anti-communist. When the Bolshevik revolution struck, he favored intervention. He argued hard for intervention and got it. Um, I'll come back to that in a little while. He wrote ominously about uh, communism of what he called the international Jews and their sinister confederacy. Uh, as against what he called the national Jews, who were the Zionist movement, uh, whose objectives he supported, um, who believed in colonization. He thought that, that was far more respectable and honorable way to behave than to uh, take part in these internationalist movements, which he regarded uh, as an affront to civilization. Um, it should be said, of course, that, uh, you know, he, 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 that wasn't his whole critique of communism, but uh, I mention this because um, the official um, myth-making about Churchill is that he was a friend of the Jews, a philo Semite, and so on. And sometimes uh, statements like this are actually invoked as though they are examples of his philo Semitism, which I think tells you something about the particular English culture of self-congratulation over our distinctly liberal culture. And the fact that we didn't develop a, a, an anti dreyfusard style uh, anti Semitic movement like France or uh, a movement like Germany, for example. Incidentally, um, 
the industry devoted to cleaning up Churchill's record on the score of anti-Semitism uh, devolves into some quite um, extraordinary um, gymnastics. A few years back, uh, maybe 2007, there was an article of his that was discovered in the records um, in which he had said that the Jews were inviting persecution and had brought some of it on themselves. Now, to be fair, the article uh, didn't actually support the persecution of the Jews, but it did consist of um, advice to Jewish people saying that they, in order to escape persecution, they must eschew communism, be good citizens, mixed with non-Jews, all that sort of stuff, which is absolutely classical uh, church or material. Now, his official myth makers insist that actually it's not a problem because he didn't write it, which is true. He didn't write it himself. Um, it was written by his ghostwriter, um, which is not to say that it didn't reflect his views. And they also point out that his ghostwriter was a member of the British Union of Fascists and therefore could probably have inflected the article with um, his views on Jews. Now, there's two problems with that. First of all, he had a ghostwriter who was a member of the British Union of Fascists. And second of all, he tried to get the article, which he supposedly didn't agree with, published twice in two separate venues with no success. He later, when somebody came back to him asking to publish it, in, I think 1940, um, declined to have it published because it was the start of the war and it wasn't a good idea for him to be associated with such views. Um, but if he didn't like the views in it, he had no way of showing it. And I would suggest that his support for the Zionist movement uh, should be understood in this light. Incidentally, um, uh, this was part of his whole, uh, obviously, his colonial purview. When he was giving evidence to the Palestine Royal Commission in, uh, I think it was 1937, he told them, I do not admit that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians, Indians of America or the black people of Australia by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, has come in and taken its place. Now, to be clear, what we're talking about here um, is genocide. Um, this wasn't a mystery. It wasn't like anybody didn't know that this is what he was talking about. But um, this racial perception of uh, condign victim and of who deserves to die or who can be reasonably killed uh, is linked to his technophobia. Oh, sorry, pardon me, his technophilia. Um, so, for example, with regard to uh, the famous quote regarding the use of poison gas against uncivilized tribes in Iraq, um, that he first of all developed the use of poison gas in Russia um, during the intervention against communism. Um, his argument for using it in Iraq uh, was quite interesting. This was during the British mandate when Iraqis were in rebellion against the British. And what he argued was that it was more merciful to use poison gas because, first of all, it would not do as much damage as explosive shells. And second of all, it would be so overwhelming and spread such terror that the people would give up quickly and thus spread, spare their lives uh, as many as possible. Um, incidentally, this logic has repeatedly been used in the de deployment of new and ever more deadly technologies up to the point that if you look at uh, the arguments over the use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the arguments in favor of it tend to involve the idea that because it spread terror in the Japanese, it made sure that they give up earlier than they would have done and thus save lives. So um, this is... Um, where racial perception, as I say, and technophilia are combined. Um, and it also means that um, when you think about the logic of this argument for using poison gas against uh, so-called uncivilized tribes, there's no possibility of negotiating with or taking seriously uh, or giving any legitimacy whatsoever to any claim made by the colonized. And that was a consistent Churchill view. Uh, or communists, who are, of course, uh, in his view, less than human, bestial, as he would say. And it was in part due to his anti-communism that he sympathized with fascism when it emerged. The historian Paul Addison wrote, with fascism as such, he had no quarrel. What he uh, was concerned about was the international uh, orientations of German fascism. I'll come back to that. Of Mussolini, he said, he is the greatest lawgiver among men. 
and he had rendered a service to the whole world in a war against communism, unions and the left. He said to Mussolini, if I had been Italian, I am sure I should have been wholeheartedly with you from the start to finish in your triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. Externally, your movement has rendered service to the whole world. Of Hitler, he expressed admiration for the courage, the perseverance and the vital force which enabled him to overcome all the resistances which barred his path. And his writing on World War II, if you read his uh, multi-volume history of the Second World War, it's extraordinary how sympathetically he portrays Hitler, not as someone he agrees with at all, but as someone with honourable, if exaggerated, devotion to nation and race, horrified by the rise of communism. Uh, and he didn't uh, approve of the Nazi regime's internal policies, or not all of them. Uh, he did not favour persecuting Jews, for example, but it was their external ambitions, as I say, that alarmed him. He didn't have a problem with Mussolini invading Ethiopia, so this wasn't about colonizing parts of the world that, in his view, were eminently suitable for colonization. This was about Hitler applying the motifs of the British Empire to Europe um, and essentially trying to apply that logic to Europeans, which he felt was um, uncivilized. Yet, even when he became a ruling class renegade and began to argue for rearmament against Hitler, when the vast majority of the British ruling class and the military establishment was in favor of uh, supporting Hitler in his uh, fight with Russia and communism, um, he still preferred to pursue a pro-fascist struggle against Hitler. What do I mean by that? Well, he wanted to isolate Hitler chiefly by allying with Italian fascism and with Franco in Spain, whose war against the Communist Front, as he described the uh, Republic, he saw as a valid anti-Red movement. Even as late as 1940, after the Neville Chamberlain government had fallen and Churchill had formed a coalition government, he was pleading with Mussolini and Franco to form an alliance with Britain. Now, the Second World War, could be seen from many perspectives uh, as many different types of war, uh, an anti-fascist war, a national liberation war, anti-colonial people's war, Russian self-defense, Chinese self-defense. For Churchill, it was just an imperialist war. It was about the glory of the British Empire and Hitler had trodden on its toes and he prosecuted it as such, again, relishing the technological slaughter that it could unleash. Britain, he, he said, must destroy the Nazi regime through an absolutely devastating, exterminating attack by very heavy bombers. By this, he meant bombing working class residential areas rather than strategic infrastructure on the premise that it would destroy the morale of the German people and get them to break with fascism. Now, I think we know from history that simply doesn't happen but it culminated this approach in the uh, notorious um, and infamous firebombing of Dresden. He was also contemptuous of the contributions of Indian soldiers and utterly, barbarously indifferent to the famine caused in Bengal by his policies and particularly by the British appropriations of food um, at a time in which a famine was beginning to develop and as a result killed three million people. Unlike his father, Lord Randolph, who actually ha had a certain fondness for India, an imperialist fondness, uh, he didn't particularly think that they should govern themselves. Churchill absolutely despised India. He sneered that they bred like rabbits. So of course they were going to starve. And if there was a famine, he said, how come Gandhi was still alive? Couldn't conceal his contempt, didn't even try. In the aftermath of the war, which he played a significant role in having won, he was quick to try to contain the progressive forces that he had unleashed unconsciously and it, to him hatefully as a necessary byproduct of the war. Because, of course, the coalition government had legitimized uh, the Labour Party, it had legitimized the agenda of uh, social reform, it had radicalized the British population, and of course, globally, the waging of this fight against uh, Hitler and fascism um, unleashed all sorts of uh, progressive forces. Um, he, for example, opposed outright putting any pressure on the Franco regime to even moderate his dictatorship. 
claiming that communism would become masters of Spain in that event, and that then the infection, as he put it, would spread very fast through both Italy and France. So he was a pioneer of belligerent Cold War rhetoric. Uh, he was the one responsible for the Iron Curtain speech. Um, he was uh, intensely lobbying for the United States to take up uh, the imperial burden in this respect. And though he couldn't, with this anti-socialist rhetoric, see off major social reform in the UK, um, and in fact was uh, driven out of government in the uh, general election of 1945 with a landslide Labour victory, he was able to come back to power in 1951, and although he had to accept the majority of Labour's reforms, um, he had one more term of brutal imperial slaughter, this time waging uncompromising war against the Mamo uprising in Kenya, which involved the use of concentration camps, uh, which I suppose he, as a British soldier, would have seen for the first time deployed by the British Empire in the context of the Boer War. Um, and also against the Malayan insurgency. In Malaya, he experimented with the use of Agent Orange and saturated bombing, saturation bombing, which uh, techniques the United States would later use in Vietnam. So Churchill, just to sum up very quickly here, Churchill was in some respects like his father in that he was a maverick Tory and uh, a ruling class renegade at times but he was still very much somebody who thought historically and globally for his class and for uh, his empire, which he was most committed to. He was an intelligent, sophisticated imperialist, insofar as that is possible, uh, but he was also a brute and an upper class thug. His mouth really did run with blood. I'll leave it there. Bhaskar, I think you're on mute. I am on mute. I'm no longer on mute now. Uh, I had pressed the mute button, and then I pressed it again. So here we go. Um, but thank you for that, Richard. Um, I'm sorry we had to have you talk on such a dour uh, subject, but the Churchill myth is really, really resilient. And I think especially so in the United States. And I, I do think that's a product of Hollywood. It's a uh, product of the fact that Americans uh, have held up World War II as the, the good war. Because uh, in, in many sense, I, I think, as you put in your book, uh, interventions in war almost never improve the situation of a humanitarian uh, crisis, but there's a couple exceptions, maybe World War II, maybe uh, India's intervention in Bangladesh, whatever the reasons for that intervention, maybe Vietnam and Cambodia and so on. But there's a constant harping on the exceptions to then justify things like the Iraq war, then to embody that kind of um, uh, spirit and so on. So uh, there's a couple questions in the chat that I'll try to get to as, as quickly as possible. Um, Let's see. Here's one question from Matthew, which is, can Richard foresee the dilution of Churchill's reputation over the coming, uh, in the coming years for the generations in, in America and the UK in particular? Um, or does he believe that his myth is kind of now necessary to imperial um, ideology? So what do you see the trajectory of the Churchill myth going forward? And I guess this is a hard question because this depends a lot on the success of the left and, and uh, how much we can get our, our message to resonate and whether we can hold up real working class heroes from that period. Um, you know, even if people do want heroes from World War II, there's plenty of heroes from the resistance, there's plenty, plenty of heroes from the home army. And, and even if you do want to, to valorize soldiers, you could valorize rank and file soldiers who, who had nothing, who had very little stake in the societies that they went off to to uh, defend yes, it on um, conflict. Well, as regards the viability of the Churchill cult, um, first of all, it has survived this long, so there's no inherent reason why it couldn't be prolonged in perpetuity. Um, however, th we should pay attention to the uh, wider geopolitical context in which this myth operates. US imperialism is in decline. Now, that's not uh, irreversible. Um, uh, Obama showed uh, a, one way in which uh, imperial decline could be 
showed up, stopped, and uh, you know, reversal begun. But it does seem to be an imperial decline, and that will change the politics around. I mean, for example, uh, take something like uh, COVID nineteen. Um, I, I realize that this sounds like me trying to crowbar in a, a sort of very um, relevant subject, but actually uh, it's something I've been thinking about with regard to imperialism, because if uh, we had the, uh, old Washington, classical Washington, um, you know, Obama-style Washington, Clinton-style Washington, even George W. Bush-style Washington, um, there would be some attempt at a globally coordinated um ultimately pro-capitalist, neoliberal response to uh, the plague. And at present, what you have is a lot of patchy national level responses with very little coordination, a lot of competition. Um, and I think that tells us something about where we are. So that may mean that uh, Churchill will come to seem to be less relevant. Um, there's also the declining currency of what is sometimes called whiteness. I I'm increasingly skeptical of this terminology, but um, it refers to something real. Um, certainly people ha can have uh, an investment in race and con contiguously in nationalism and in martial nationalism. Um, but that seems to me uh, to be one of the things that we're going through at the moment with the Brexit right in the United Kingdom, with Trump in the United States, may well be the last gasp of a certain generation of um, people with those kinds of investments. Certainly, uh, there's been a process of social demographic change and liberalization on a whole range of uh, social uh, questions. So it's not unforeseeable to me that if the left uh, manages to survive and um, uh, thrive in the coming years, that it will be able to see off the Churchill myth. Um, but that would also, uh, to borrow uh, a Marxian phrase, require um, to abolish the Churchill myth requires abolishing the conditions which require the Churchill myth. Right, true of the Catholic Church, true of Churchill, <laughs> true of all religion. <laughs> um, so um, let's see, there's one question from, um, I actually did not write down, I think this was from um, Venu. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it seems um, that other right-wingers in the 1940s would have made peace with Hitler, whereas Churchill wouldn't. So in other words, he's asking for a contextualization of his uh, inarguable racist imperialist uh, legacy with the fact that he did play a role averting Nazi consolidation on the Western Front. He was willing to uh, because of the necessities of war, um, for example, turn on his his old ingrained ideological anti-Bolshevism and give uh, weapons and support to Stalin um, in, in, in pursuit of the, the common enemy. Whereas other, so on the extreme end, obviously there are reactionaries within his own country, maybe his former ghostwriter included, I don't know his trajectory, who wanted to capitulate completely or join the same side as the Nazis. And there was a lot of other conservatives who wanted some sort of um, uh, peace uh, made with, with Nazism. So what about Hitler's role in resistance? Um, uh, what, what would you respond to that? I think relatively common caveat from people who even accept that the rest of his political history was an odious one, but want to give him some credit for, for his years of, of resistance. I have absolutely no problem with that. Um, I, I don't see that uh, one has to I mean, we can recognize the reasons why he uh, turned against Hitler as being rooted in fundamentally an imperialist worldview, which we cannot defend um, without saying that, you know, that deserves no credit whatsoever. Um, I think it, 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 he, he deserves credit for being, as I said, farsighted and historically minded. He was very widely read within a certain uh, sort of very European parochial uh, perspective. Um, but this gave him enough uh, intuition and insight to uh, realize that Hitler was uh, a bigger threat than Stalin. Um, and uh, another prime minister would not have had that perception. Um, and also it must be said that the uh, horrendous um, love for violence and death and danger, which drove his uh, imperialism, also made him into uh, 
pretty um, uh, terrifying foe in some ways for Hitler. Now, we can also, in that connection, also criticize the ways in which he prosecuted the war. And I think an anti-fascist war would have uh, attempted to uh, spare the population as much as possible and try to exercise some what you might call soft power uh, with regard to those people and try to break away as many of them as possible. But um, I have no problem whatsoever with saying that Churchill um, as British ruling class monsters go, as thugs go, as imperialists go, um, did something very, very important uh, for the history of humanity um, in deciding to turn ruling class renegade on that occasion. So, so there's a couple of people in the chat asking about Churchill's role in, in Ireland. Um, I guess he did deploy the black and tans and he was, I guess, um, uh, Secretary for War, whatever your equivalent of, of Secretary of Defense is, um, uh, during during the uh, War for Independence. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, can you can you answer that question? I don't know about this uh, episode in detail. Um, and uh, the best thing I can say to you, uh, the best thing I can recommend to you, is Paul Bue's book, um, which um, details uh, you know a, a really infamous story uh, with regard to Churchill and Ireland. But if I try to, um, uh, you know, pull together my sort of the tender threads of uh, sort of memory that I have of that book, uh, I wouldn't be doing it any service. So please look up Paul Bue's book um, and uh, you'll get the full story there. Um, I, I do know that uh, Churchill um, was, um, I mean, as, as in all parts of the empire, committed to absolutely ferocious, uncompromising force. Um, in, in overwhelming Irish opposition. Um, I, I don't know that uh, he, I think that uh, it's quite likely um, that his attitude to the Irish was intensely racist. Um, but as I say, I think you should uh, look to mm -hmm. somebody who is um, immersed in that history more than I am. So what about the Labour Party's relationship to, I guess this kind of gets to your last question. Um, there's someone asking about the fact that the Labour Party with support of the CPGB um, insisted that if there had to be a Tory leader of the war coalition, that it'd be Churchill over Chamberlain or the other alternatives. But I, I guess that gets to your, your other answer, which is that in this particular moment, there might have been virtues to Churchill over other members of the British ruling class and uh, it was plainly obvious for even um, some communists in Britain at the time. Well, just to be clear, um, the, the Labour Party um, despised Churchill. Um, so the fact that they um, uh, supported a government led by him should tell you, you know, where the British ruling class was at that time and how dangerous its position was. Um, the official press of the trade unions, of the Labour Party and of the Communist Party had been vilifying Churchill for years, justifiably so, because when they saw what he said about Mussolini, when they saw what uh, he said about um, fascism and Spain, uh, they concluded that he was himself a fascist. Um, and that was quite a common thing to say in the left-wing press. Uh, also, not forgetting uh, his um, uh, sort of record against the miners in South Wales, which um, entered into the uh, sort of memory of the British working class at that time. So uh, they turned to Churchill against their own sort of prior history and their wider predilections. I just think it says that they recognized an incredible danger and that they, there was no choice but to try um, at enormous cost um, to destroy Hitler. Right. So um, I think that that this gets to the the crux of a lot of these questions. I'm trying to see if there's there's any more absolutely burning questions that we we have to to um, bring up, you know, people are, are mentioning instances of, of Churchill's actions, like his, his role in, in Greece, um, um, in a way, helping to instigate the Greek civil war with a brutal repression of a protest. But I think that just fits into this broader arc of 
anti-communism. So as soon as the war was over, his his goal was to uh, spark a cold war to prevent the expansion of, of what he saw as 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 the the communist threat, both in the form of the Soviet Union, but also in the form of average ordinary people around the world fighting against colonialism, fighting for uh, basic labor rights and, and dignities. I'm not sure there's a lot more to say um, there, um, but maybe you have more to add on, on, on Greece or maybe just generally on his, his uh, legacy and how he's interpreted as a figure in um, former colonies of the, the British Empire. Um, it might just be my my bias, but I I, I certainly grew up in a house where Churchill was uh, was reviled um, mm -hmm. as the the uh, epitome of a of a British uh, imperialist. I'm sure a lot of people in in Ireland or in other parts of the former British Empire were too. Well, I mean, not in the part of Ireland that I grew up right. in. Yes. I grew up in Northern Ireland, and uh, the, the you know the Unionist establishment loved Churchill. But yes, I mean. I, I can't, I, I'm not going to go into any detail about this because, uh, you know, I think this is quite well known, um, quite obvious. There are parts of uh, England and Scotland where Churchill is still here to, to this day. Um, certainly in Ireland, so Southern Ireland, uh, the public of Ireland, he is um, loathed. I know that, um, I mean, you just mentioned that, that uh, you know, in, in India, um, he is regarded as a genocidal monster. and. So um, I think that just reflects the fact that um, uh, different um, groups of people in the world have had very different experiences of Churchill. Is a popular memory still there in South Wales about, about his role in 1910 and the... the... I mean, like, yeah, but insofar as, um, I mean, the, the um, mining communities have been devastated long ago. Um, and you know the trade union movement there is a lot weaker. But insofar as there remains a labor movement in this country, insofar as there remain cultures of laborism, that memory uh, persists um, and is still talked about to this day. Now, um, it's one of those things that regularly comes up in the histories um, and regularly comes up on the I think the Churchill Institute, um, which dedicates itself to um, protecting his reputation. Um, and every time there's a controversy about something that Churchill said or did, of which there are many, um, it's the Churchill Institute that comes out fighting um, and wielding Martin Gilbert um, to defend the man. But yes, this is a memory. This is a practical, concrete memory. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those subaltern knowledges that is uh, completely forgotten by the culture industry and by the national media. Right. And I think it's worth saying that I, I think it, as far as rhetoric, and also just generally understanding the context, what you said about Churchill in the context of World War II makes perfect sense. It's also, I think, worth uh, reiterating the fact that Churchill aided and abetted um, the rise of fascism um, in its Italian form. He mm -hmm. certainly was no friend of Spanish Republicans in the 1930s, and he contributed to the political environment that got to the point where, where a Hitler uh, was able to roll across uh, Europe. His actual war record uh, from a military standpoint is also a bit questionable. Um, there's debates about the Norwegian campaign, who's to blame. There's debates about the the fall of Singapore, which kind of go on both sides or some some kind of like right wing <laughs> um, complaints about Churchill's mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, role in the fall of uh, Singapore's and and and. and complaints from the, the the left as well so it, it's all kind of a, a complex figure as far as his actual um record during world war ii and whether or not someone would be able to um to play a similar role and whether you know it took a speech to inspire british workers uh to defend their their homeland against uh, nazi um bombings or whether you know, this was just something that ordinary people were doing for all sorts of uh, completely understandable and legitimate reasons. Um, you know, I think those are all uh, useful things to discuss, but I, I think you did a great job cataloging a long and really terrible political history from Churchill. I think this is the kind of discussions we need more on the left, not just to inform each other about 
a figure that I'm sure most Jack had been channel viewers didn't was were not favorably inclined to begin with, but to you know actually um, add some some meat to our our, our criticism. So when we go forward in, in public domains, we could actually say, you know, we just don't have vague bad feelings about Churchill. Um, he was he was a figure that that epitomized a lot that was wrong about the old um, Britain, and hopefully going forward we'll build a new Britain and a new America, you know, countries built on, on imperialism in the past, but hopefully in the future that can be part of, of something international, something democratic, something far, far different. Uh, if we do get to that point, I think Richard has played a small but important role um, recatalyzing the Anglo-American left. Um, I hope all of you uh, check out his books uh, I hope you press like and press subscribe. Um, it'll make our talented video producer, Kale Brooks, very happy, as well as myself. And we're on again tomorrow for another episode of Weekends with Anna Kasparian and Nando Vila. Our guest tomorrow is Matt Karp, who'll be talking about the five-year Bernie Sanders campaign. It's basically Bernie Sanders is campaigning from April 2015 to around March and April of 2020. So what did it accomplish? Why did it fail? Where do we go from here? Uh, that and more tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. And we're back again um, next week on Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays with more Jackman Talks. On Labor Day, we're talking with Liza Featherstone about uh, the long struggle to unionize Walmart. But uh, thanks a lot, Richard. And thank you, Kale, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks. Mm -hmm.